Thank you very much. Uh, so first, I want to thank the the uh, organizers for inviting me to this conference for a speaker slot. Um, it's a big, big honor for me to to speak here uh, for this great conference in honor of of Jill. Um, I still remember how I met Jill the first time. I think I was a first year master student uh, at the University of, of Trier, and in one of our monthly colloquiums, uh, Harald Luschke had invited Jill to, to give a talk, and um, Jill was speaking about numerical methods uh, yeah, for option pricing using quantization, and uh, I, I think at that moment I have not understood too much, but uh, later Harald also gave me a, a printed version, it was one of these old uh, LPMA preprint series of, of that paper, um, time long before archive. And um, yeah, that somehow I think changed my life because um, then I decided to do a diploma thesis on quantization, then decided to do a PhD on quantization and afterwards still, um, yeah, went actually to, to Paris to uh, work as a postdoc together with, with Jill on, on quantization. And um, yeah, today I, I want to present some some work I did there together with Jill. Um, I mean, this this vector quantization has been around the block for for quite some some time. If you look at uh, Google Scholar for the term vector quantization, you will find over one hundred thousand papers, and I think uh, approximately one hundred are even coming from Jill himself. Um, yeah, so uh, there, there has been extensive research on, on that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, Jill and me managed then to add still a complete new chapter to, to that topic. And uh, this is dual quantization, which I want to present here today. Okay, I will start um, again with, with a regular vector quantization. We have seen this already in the talk before, but I want to quickly go through that, that you get familiar with, with my mutation. So we have a probability space uh, with a random vector x um, onto Rd with the, the Borel sigma algebra. And then for any finite set subset alpha from Rd, the LP quantization error of x um, is defined as the minimal LP distance from X to Z points in, in alpha. And then the optimal quantization problem at level X consists in minimizing these quantity over all subsets alpha with a fixed cardinality N. And this is uh, denoted by EN of X in my notation. So this is the optimal Nth quantization error of X. Here you can see an example for the standard normal distribution in two dimensions. These are 225 um, points, which gives the best approximation in the um, L2 sense for the Euclidean norm to, to this uh, distribution. And you can see that somehow makes sense. We have the, the quantization points concentrated on, on the center. This is there where we have uh, also the mass of the uh, normal distribution concentrated. And there, um, yeah, you need to have put most of the points in order to minimize the error there because um, they, if you make an error here in the center, um, it will have a la yeah, relative large impact and then it fades out um, to, to, to the sides. Um, what you also see here beneath the points, these blue regions, is something um, yeah, which is called the Voronoi partition. And uh, with the set C A of alpha, I will denote a Voronoi partition that is a Borel partition, which is satisfying um, the condition that every x um, is closer as uh, this that. A is, is closer to, to every X in that region um, than any other point in, in these um, quantization grid uh, alpha. And uh, I have to take here a subset there because we don't know exactly um, how to handle the borders to which cell we, we actually want to, to um, yeah, account for them. 
Having defined such a uh, Voronoi partition, we then can um, define the nearest neighbor projection. So pi alpha is actually um, yeah this operator which maps um, the whole Voronoi region into the point of A. And um, using that nearest neighbor projection, we can then define the Voronoi quantization of X just by applying this nearest neighbor projection to our random variable X and then get some um, yeah, new discretized random variable X hat, which um, has its values in the finite grid alpha. Um, yeah, here again, uh, more details on such a Voronoi um, tessellation in RD. So uh, it means that every point here in that uh, region will be actually mapped into this uh, red point here by that kind of uh, nearest neighbor projection. One of the very important properties for um, quantizers and, and vector quantization is actually um, stationarity. And for the um, Voronoi quantization, stationarity is defined as a property that uh, the expectation of x under uh, the Voronoi quantizer x hat equals the Voronoi quantizer x hat and this um, stationarity condition is uh, fulfilled um, for for any optimal quantizers alpha star that means uh, if we have a set um, alpha star with cardinality less than less equal than n and um, the lp distance of this um, voronoi quantization is equals to the equals to the optimal quantization error then um, yeah, such a quantizer also fulfills the, the stationarity. But um, that is a property which is only uh, fulfilled here for, for, for certain quantizers, those which, which actually have the, the first derivative um, as, as zero and does not have hold for, for any arbitrary quantizer, which might be not optimal. Why, why is this stationarity so important? It's important because when we use um, quantization for the yeah, for curvature formulas or other kind of, of approximation and have a little bit of smoothness, then we can do a Taylor expansion and uh, cancel out the, the first term here. And um, those uh, stationary quantizers allow us then to move to a uh, second order scheme here. The main characteristics for uh, vector quantization in, in RD um, is, is actually given by, by the so-called Sadat theorem, which um, describes the, the sharp asymptotics for the optimal quantization error. And there we assume that um, X is uh, LP prime with some prime strictly greater than P and have a composition of uh, Px into the absolute continuous part and the singular part with respect to the uh, Lebesgue measure. And then uh, the Sado theorem uh, tells us actually that the quantization error goes to zero with a rate one to the power of minus, uh, uh, n to the power of minus one over d. And uh, in addition, we can also, um, derive some formula for the exact constants of this convergence. So this is consisting of two parts. There is the u of d, which is a uh, universal constant, which is independent of uh, our distribution px and, and n. So we can choose that u d, for example, as the limit for the uh, uniform distribution. And then a second component, which is just um, yeah, relying on the uh, density of the absolutely continuous part. So um, yeah, what, what we see here is um, that this is also somehow um, the, the curse of uh, dimensionality. So um, we see that uh, going into higher dimensions um, that gets um, somehow exponentially harder. 
And um, the general rate is um, this, uh, as I said, n to the power of uh, minus one over d. That is um, the, the the optimal rate you can achieve uh, over the whole class of Lipschitz functions. So you cannot do any better on that big class. But um, as I said, when when we uh, Add a little bit of smoothness. If you know, for example, uh, that that our f would be um, continuously differentiable, then um, we can do um, these, these Taylor expansion and stationary quantizers will lead us here to a rate of n to the power of minus two over d. And um, yeah, that is not only the theory; that is also something we can really then observe. Um, using numerical computations. Okay, um, now I want to go back into the uh, one-dimensional setting. Um, yeah, here in, in we have two, two grid points, a n, a n plus one, and the Voronoi cell and the one-dimensional setting is just an interval. And the blue line here is uh, the boundary of the Voronoi cell. And if I have now a new, realization of my random variable x, let's call it xi, it might fall here into that Voronoi cell. It means we would map it to the a n plus one. So um, in general, it means that with our nearest neighbor projection, um, we are somehow off uh, for nearly all of the points. Um, and in general, if you can increase the, the n, uh, this, this error becomes smaller and smaller, and it's not so much of an issue. But um, if we have only a small n, or if our x would be in, in discrete distribution, then um, the and, and our quantizer is, is not optimal, and we cannot place it at these um, mass points of the discrete distribution. Then this, this bias can be um, really um, significant, and that was actually also the case when I was working with with Jill on a problem of um, yeah, approximation of some value at risk computation and uh, for for credit risk options, and um, yeah, there we we had some convolution of some discretized uh, or some discrete um, distribution, and um, we knew that it would converge for for large n somehow to either Poisson or normal distribution. So um, we would choose a grid either coming from a Poisson or normal distribution there. But uh, the the reality, the the object we had to to approximate was somehow in between. It was um, yeah already too large to compute it um, yeah, by hand and manually and fit on that distribution directly a quantization grid, but all still too far away from the uh, continuous distribution that um, yeah, this, this gap which we had here was, was really giving us um, some, some suboptimal results there. And um, yeah, what was then our idea? Um, the, the idea was actually to go a little bit away from this um, nearest neighbor projection and introduce some kind of stochastic mapping. So actually we wanted to map this Xi not only to the um, AN plus one, but we also wanted to, to map it a little bit to, to the AN. And um, yeah, doing that in a probabilistic manner, so with some probability uh, lambda, we would map it to a n plus one, and one minus lambda, we would map it to a n. So um, yeah, more precisely, we would um, define some lambda of psi, which is um, yeah, psi minus i n divided by the distance between those grid points, and then would actually define a stochastic quantization mapping where we add an additional uh, probability space uh, omega zero with p zero being just the uniform distribution on the interval zero one and um, yeah then depending on uh, where our uniform distribution would uniform distributed random variable would lie would either map it to a n or a n plus one and um, then on these new probability space, uh, we would in average in the expectation 
be always exact with our new operator. So that is something, um, yeah, which which uh, would not hold, for example, for for the regular quantization setting. So um, yeah, motivated by this property, which we were able to achieve here in uh, one dimension, we um, defined some kind of intrinsic stationarity. So we will call any stochastic um, quantization operator, which is now yeah, defined on the Cartesian product of these um, alpha zero and RD mapping into RD with values in, in alpha and which fulfills actually these conditions that for every psi in the convex hull of our quantization grid alpha that the expectation of that operator for a fixed psi equals psi we call such an operator intrinsic stationary. And um, yeah, then it can be shown actually that, um, yeah, if we go now on, on the whole product space of um, uh, omega zero and uh, RD, so it's uh, then these, these probability measures P zero uh, times, times P, then uh, this intrinsic stationarity condition is uh, equivalent to, to the fact that the, um, yeah, the stochastic quantization operator applied to X conditioning on X is reproducing X itself. And um, yeah, this kind of stationarity would also allow to, um, yeah, to derive a second order formula for, for approximation. And uh, what what is the advantage here of of this um, new kind of stationarity is that we will actually establish a canonical way to construct um, those kind of um, stochastic quantization operator um, for any kind of of quantization grid alpha, not only for optimal ones. So um, yeah, one. We had so far established this all in the, the one dimensional setting and um, saw that it was working quite well there. But the uh, question was a little bit uh, how would we um, generalize that to, to a multi dimensional setting? And um, yeah, one way um, to do that is actually taking this um, stationarity condition and we could define an optimal dual quantization error for now compactly supported X because, um, yeah, everything actually then um, the, the whole construction which we had here was is only possible on the uh, convex hull of, of our um, grid alpha. So um, yeah, we, we, we need first to, to restrict to only then compactly supported uh, random um, variables X. And um, we define then the optimal dual quantization error actually then as the LP um, distance between X and these um, um, stochastic random operator tau, tau alpha, where tau alpha has to be intrinsic stationary. Alpha is again a subset of, of uh, RD with cardinality less equal than N, and we um, yeah we require to not get uh, some undefined quantities here that uh, also the convex hull of this alpha is containing the whole support of our measure P. Um, yeah, since um, this stochastic um, mapping operator also just takes uh, its values in the grid um, alpha. It's, it's clear that it's a great, always greater equal than the uh, minimal distance between X and the grid alpha. So um, this neural optimal dual quantization error um, is always greater equal than uh, the existing regular quantization error. Um, more practical version actually to look at this um, dual quantization error is then uh, given by the, the following proposition. So um, 
<clears throat> what what we do here is actually we we try to generalize a little bit the the construction from the one dimensional setting. So um, yeah, we we have here that. Um, condition of um, intrinsic stationarity that we can um, yeah <clears throat> reconstruct every x by a uh, convex combination of our grid points a n um, the sum of the uh, lambda n is is equals to one which then also um, yeah makes it um, somehow uh, a probability distribution and they they all have to be be positive and the errors now are weighted by our um, coefficients uh, lambda n so um, speaking geometrically we we now um, yeah don't take only two points we we allow actually to be <coughs> the um, yeah, the, the operator, some some the mapping operator to be some kind of convex combination over all uh, possible points in in our grid set. So given here a, a quite um, general definition of of these um, optimization uh, problem, but um, yeah, it it is it can be shown that this is uh, equivalent to the definition above. Um, now we have to look a little bit deeper on these uh, local quantization error here, and for that actually, um, yeah, I, I want to denote a, a fixed realization of x as x psi. So the the local optimization error actually is, um, yeah, this kind of uh, linear programming problem. So with the notation below, we uh, want to minimize uh, lambda transpose C, where C is an n-dimensional vector, which uh, encodes the uh, distances from alpha to psi, subject to um, some linear side condition that we have uh, A, lambda equals b and uh, lambda greater equal zero. And um, yeah, for, for these kind of linear problems, um, it is um, well known that a solution um, will lie in the, on the extremal points of the, the constraints. And therefore there exists some fundamental basis um, I star uh, with just d plus one components um, such that after some some reorderings in our lambda and vector and uh, in the matrix a uh, we can express uh, a solution to that lp as um, lambda i star where lambda i star is the inverse of those um, rows of the matrix i which correspond to to that um, basis uh, i star times b and all the other um, components will actually uh, can be set to to zero and uh, yeah in order to to make use of of these um, fundamental basis construction uh, we define the set of admissible indices which is which are the subsets of uh, the set one to n of size d plus one, such that the rank of the matrix A restricted to this subset is uh, d plus one, so that we have uh, d plus one linearly independent um, rows in in uh, d in in in, in this um, in this matrix. And um, yeah, this allows us already to, to make a step forward uh, with our splitting functional. So instead of, if this is our point Xi, instead of having all possible grid points uh, active in our uh, convex combination, uh, we now know that uh, actually it's enough to uh, take three points, which is a triangle in the two-dimensional setting where we map our um, simulation data point x to. One question which is still open here is, um, yeah, which is the right combination of three points in these two-dimensional planes? So we could also make a triangle by choosing 
these three points here, for example, or um, yeah, that one. Oh, that one did not not work well here. But um, yeah, it's it's usually um, not clear at all um, which which is the right triangle then to choose for for our um, splitting functional. In one dimension, it was was rather clear that we would take the, the interval where the, the data point actually is, is lying in. And um, yeah, it, we can then make use of the dual representation of our linear programming problem. So um, instead of minimizing a lambda times uh, C, we will now maximize a vector U, uh, which is uh, D plus one dimensional times um, B. Just to, to, to remember, B was actually um, the vector psi one and the side condition now is uh, a transpose u is uh, smaller than c and c was um, composed of the vector being the lp uh, distances from xi to, to alpha and uh, yeah there uh, uh, it is also known that um, if uh, i is an admissible index set so that um, alpha i as defined on the previous slide is optimal for lp and in addition alpha i is strictly greater than zero component wise then also this side condition for the matrix a restricted to our in the indices i times u is um, equal to c Okay, and uh, having recapped these, these basics about uh, linear programming, we can now uh, further characterize the uh, optimal structure of the triangles in the Euclidean setting and uh, P equals two. So therefore, let uh, I be again some admissible index and uh, we, we choose a xi of the uh, interior of the convex hull, which is um, generated by that i, such that uh, lambda i is a solution to LP and let then u be a solution for, for the dual uh, linear programming problem. Such an, um, yeah, such an xi will uh, exist under some yeah, moderate um, assumptions. And um, since this xi is uh, from the interior of that convex hull, um, we have that this lambda i defined as, as uh, ai, the inverse of ai times b is strictly greater than zero. And therefore, also from the slide before, um, the, the constraint ai transpose u equals c, so that we can actually write for um, yeah, the, the, the general part of the constraints. So this is for every index E that we have um, AU is smaller uh, or is, is less equal than C, but for every J, which is part of our admissible index set, we uh, have equality in, in that. Um, yeah, in that constraint. So um, yeah, then rewriting the uh, lower line to U2 and um, yeah, substituting also this uh, equality into the above line, we arrive at um, yeah, this new equality and inequality and um, expanding now both sides this is a well chosen term, C transpose UI plus uh, UI half uh, squared Euclidean norm. We can uh, do basic calculus for the Euclidean norm and uh, therefore get, um, yeah, on, on the left side uh, of the equality, uh, this term on the right hand side, you see, um, yeah, there is a new point Xi plus U1 divided by two, which uh, is repeated in, in both sides. And um, this data point we will now define as that, and then can conclude that uh, the distance 
uh, of our grid points AJ, which belong to the admissible um, index set, are all on, on a hypersphere. They have all the same distance to this new value Z. And in general, uh, we also see that no other point in our grid alpha um, yeah, would lie in the interior of this uh, sphere. And um, that condition here is actually uh, called the Delaunay property, so that we can um, yeah, now come to, to our um, solution of the initial problem, which is the right triangle to choose for the um, stochastic um, quantization operator. So in the case here of the Euclidean norm, and uh, we have a finite subset alpha with a uh, fin dimension uh, D, so it's really spanning the, the whole space. And we have an um, admissible index set such that the set of xi's where Alpha uh, lambda i defined as the inverse on these uh, index times b is optimal for the LP. If that set here has a uh, non empty interior, uh, which was our condition which we had in the beginning, um, that we could define, uh, find such a point xi, then the triangle or d simplex spanned by i defines the um, Delaunay property. And going back to the example I've shown before, here we see uh, this is our point Z, and uh, we have those three points here lying all on the, the hypersphere, um, the defined by, by these three points. None of the other points is inside this um, circle, and therefore that triangle here fulfills the Delaunay property and uh, will yield uh, the, the optimal dual quantization error. And um, yeah, we can do that for all the points and that way construct the um, Delaunay diagram for, for these data points. Um, yeah, there's an important uh, relationship between Delaunay triangulation and Voronoi tessellation. Uh, actually, the Delaunay triangulation is uh, the dual graph of the Voronoi uh, diagram as, as soon as um, yeah, our discrete point set is in general position. That means that no D plus two points lie on the same hypersphere. And um, yeah, that condition is also needed in order to um, um, yeah, uniquely define the, the Delaunay triangulation. And um, you can think of maybe a, a square. There, of course, you have in, in two-dimensional space four points which are lying on the same circle. And uh, there, is, there we also have two possibilities to define a Delaunay um, triangle. It could be that direction or this direction that we um, yeah, divide the, the square into um, two triangles. And both would fulfill the, the Delaunay um, property. Um, yeah, so since the uh, nearest neighbor mapping operator pi alpha was based on the Voronoi tessellation, and now this um, optimal stochastic mapping operator tau uh, is determined by the Delaunay triangulation, uh, that was in fact the, the final motivation to call um, this, this new quantization error the, the dual quantization. And um, yeah, I, I still remember when we, we started in the one dimensional setting and yeah, just thought, okay, now we, we split it somehow randomly. Uh, we, we, we had no clues, um, yeah, how, how the theory would actually uh, evolve uh, when we turned into the, the multi dimensional case. And um, yeah, showing that again here on, on the example, you see now the Delaunay triangulation on top of the Voronoi diagram and putting again back the hypersphere here, you see that the, the center of this hypersphere defining that triangle is exactly then this 
vertex here of the um, Voronoi tessellation. And um, yeah, as long as we have no D plus two points uh, lying on the on the same um, hypersphere, we can we, we have a unique um, decomposition uh, into this uh, Delaunay triangulation. And that is also then numerical is the, the standard way if you want really construct the um, the, the the full Voronoi tessellation and and compute every of these these corners here. Good. Um, yeah, some question which I have not tackled so far is: uh, Do these optimal dual quantizers actually exist at all? And uh, here again, uh, making heavily use of the dual formulation, one can show that those dual quantizers exist. So uh, again, here for the uh, case that um, the support for p of x is compact, then um, the uh, yeah dual quantization error error function uh, with respect to our grid uh, alpha, which we now would see as a, in a functional way, not as a set anymore, as a lower semi-continuous. And uh, as long as p is strictly greater than one, it also attains the minimum. So we have actually here the same results than we get in um, for the regular quantization setting. Um, then we can also um, compute the derivative. Um, this is here only stated for the Euclidean case. And um, yeah, there we assume that um, Px satisfies the strong continuity assumption. That means we um, all hyperplanes have mass zero. We now, um, yeah, we now need the fact that uh, alpha is um, in general position. So we have a unique uh, Delaunay triangulation over alpha. Then um, our functional D, Dnx is differentiable at alpha zero with, with a partial derivative um, given by this formula where um, the lambda n is um, the, uh, the solution to, to our LP problem. And this um, set star is already that set, which we have um, seen in the slides before the center of the hypersphere um, spanning the triangle um, I. Yeah, here I quickly want to present uh, how to numerically compute these um, dual quantizers. So um, the the, the most efficient method, I think, is um, the good old stochastic gradient method for that. So we, we need some step sequence um, alpha k, which goes down to, to zero. Uh, but in the fact that the, the first moment uh, goes to infinity and only the second moment um, stays bounded. Um, we start with some initial grid uh, alpha zero that is uh, usually an, an random yeah, sample from our distribution X. And then uh, we start to generate um, IID sample XK of X. Um, need to contract the um, Delaunay triangulation, find that triangle I star, which contains XK and compute the LP solution lambda and uh, the center Z star. And then we can, um, yeah, for every J in that uh, optimal fundamental basis, I update the um, grid components by that formula. So we take the, the old value of that grip. Um, okay, that is a type O that must be a gamma K. That is the, the steps length or learning rate in the stochastic gradient algorithms and then correct it by this factor here, which is the lambda j times um, the difference between a and z. And um, yeah, if, if you look at the um, SGD for uh, the regular vector quantization, we uh, look for the nearest neighbor and would then just move <coughs> the um, aj in direction of our 
sample xk. And uh, the difference here for the dual quantization is now that we will move all the points of our triangle and de-simplex de and um, shrink them towards the center uh, proportional to um, that solution lambda of, of the uh, LP, which is, um, yeah, which can be also seen as the uh, barycentric coordinates of um, xk within that triangle or, or d simplex. And um, yeah, running these uh, algorithms for a few thousand of steps, then we can produce um, yeah, such nice quantizations here, for example, for the uniform distribution, an optimal eight quantizer in dimension two, then a quantizer of size 12. 13 and uh, 16, so extremely symmetrically. Um, so I, I think that is really uh, some numerical results which are very close to, 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 to the optimum. Um, I mean, we have no guarantee with the stochastic gradient that we will reach the, the global optimum, but um, yeah, using enough uh, initialization and a high learning rate to the beginning, it will jump around a lot and you can be rather confident that the result will be close to the global optimum which you reach. Um, yeah, so far everything is uh, extremely beautiful. Um, what was a bit more, um, yeah, uh, not that smooth anymore was actually then to uh, extend uh, the theory to, to unbounded distribution. Um, and um, the way we, we did that was actually that we were just for the um, part outside of the convex hull of alpha, we were um, yeah, using the nearest neighbor projection in, in this um, new definition. And also for, for that uh, extended dual quantization error, um, yeah, uh, one, one, one note is here that uh, even if we have uh, compactly supported um, Reynolds level X, then our dual quantization error for compact measures does not in general coincide with the optimal dual, this new extended optimal dual quantization error because, um, yeah, due to the fact that the nearest neighbor projection error is usually smaller than these um, Delaunay error part, which we have, it will happen that the corner points here, actually they will not stay at the corner anymore. They will move a little bit into the interior of, of our um, unit cube because um, they will then yield a an, an slightly smaller error than having them on, on the outside. And therefore, um, yeah, it will be the case that uh, the N is then um, strictly greater in those cases already for compactly supported PX. Um, yeah, we can also then show that um, again, these extended DN X alpha is lower semi-continuous and also attains a minimum for P greater equal to one. And applying those to the standard normal distribution, you would arrive at um, yeah, such a quantizer here with 250 data points uh, for the normal distribution. Good, and um, as a final result, uh, we then also established um, the sharp asymptotics for these extended dual quantization error. And uh, in fact, they uh, read exactly the same as uh, in the regular Voronoi quantization setting with the only difference that we get here a uh, different um, constant. And uh, for example, in dimension one, we can compute this constant exactly. And uh, in the Euclidean setting, we, we derive, for example, that the uh, constant for the dual quantization is um, square root of two times the constant from the regular quantization. A few words to the proof. Um, 
yeah, using some random quantizer argument, we were able to establish a Pierce lemma in one dimension, which then were extended to the multidimensional case uh, by the use of some product quantizations construction. Then uh, we derived a sublinearity and scaling property for dn. And here the first um, problem rose because uh, for uh, the extended dn, for the unbounded case, um, the sublinearity uh, does not hold anymore. And so we needed an additional uh, firewall lemma in order to um, yeah, replace the use of, of this sublinearity for the, the unbounded case. Um, then we could prove first the assertion in the case of the d-dimensional um, uniform distribution, could use then the firewall lemma to extend it to a convex combination of uh, uniform measures on the hypercubes. Um, we then extended it to absolutely continuous measures with compact support, uh, similar again to the uh, Bernoy setting. We were showing that the singular part of the compactly supported measures would vanish. And uh, the last step was then to combine the two results and uh, use again the firewall lemma to uh, extend the claims then to unbounded measure. Thank you very much. That was my short or a bit longer survey on how Jill and me uh, discovered dual quantization. Mm -hmm.